All right, so if you haven't picked up a solution key and you haven't taken the exam, you may do so at the end of class. There is a colloquium today. I'm advising it. I should know what it is, but right now I'm kind of out of it. I think it has something to do with Markov chains. Uh, green chicken is this Saturday at 10, 10.30 in the morning. If you do take the green chicken and you're not in Math 331, that does give you homework exemption points for future classes of mine as well as current classes. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do the beginning of Sperner's proof, of uh, the proof of Sperner's lemma, which is one way to prove the Brouwer fixed point theorem. So can someone tell me why we care about fixed point theorems? No application at all. Why would we care about fixed point theorems? Yes. Good. One of the things we'll eventually get to is fair division, you know, the rental harmony paper. They're useful for solving differential equations. They're useful for finding solutions to things. In game theory, this is Nash's, you know, famous stuff, Nash equilibria, you know, proving that stuff like this exists. The difficulty is constructive versus non-constructive proofs. And so, unfortunately, a lot of the proofs are going to just be, there must be some point where what you want to have happen happens. But, you know, finding that point is going to be very difficult. All right, so we're going to start with what's called barycentric coordinates. Has anyone seen anything like this in a physics class? So we have um, n plus 1 vectors, v0, v1, dot, 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 vn. We have n plus 1 numbers x0, x1, xn, such that each xi is in the interval 0, 1, and x0 plus xn equals 1. Where have we seen something like this before? Where have we seen something like this before? Well, binary indicator variables are when they're just, I would be replacing the square brackets with the curly brackets. So I'll write this in a more suggestive 0 less than or equal to xi less than or equal to 1. So where have we seen something like this before? It's been a while, but weights, right? This was one of the key ideas. You know, when we did multi-objective linear programming, I have two different things I simultaneously want to deal with. Maybe, I don't know, driving to Williamstown safely from the Albany Airport and making it here before the start of class. You know, speeding ticket, as long as that can be done quickly, you know, that's not necessarily something I'm going to put in the calculation. Well, when you have multiple things that you care about at the same time, you assign different weights as to how much they matter. Now, when you're deciding how much weights to do, you might as well assume the weights sum to one. If the weight summed to 50, well, you would just rescale everything by dividing by 50. The weight should also be non-negative. Okay? And so what we're really doing here is we're going to let some vector x be x0 and plus xn vn. The book often writes it as x equals x0 v0 with a superscript to just try to distinguish the fact that we're talking about vectors. This is one of the reasons why I always try to put arrows on my vectors to remind you this is a vector. In a lot of books, how do they represent a vector? What do they do to represent a vector? Yeah, they put it in bold. This is not always the best in terms of visibility on a blackboard, so I will go through and I will put the arrows over things to try to remind that I have a vector. Whenever you see a quantity, you always want to play the game, what are you? you know, vector, scalar, matrix, tensor, function, you know, what is it? And if you can just quickly glance down and look at something and have an idea of what it is, you'll have a much better sense of what's going on. All right, when you look at a bunch of vectors, if you could choose any vector, what would you choose it to be? Yes. You would choose it to be the zero vector. Which one, and this should be an extremely leading question, 
Yeah, you choose v0 or v0 to be the zero vector. Essentially, I'm going to just shift everything by v0. And so I'm just choosing where in space do I want things to be. So why not make life easy and choose the initial vector to be zero? Why do I need such generality like this? Well, eventually, you know, as you've read in the book, we're going to take our triangle and we're going to subdivide into smaller triangles. We can't have all the smaller triangles at the same point. But in some sense, the behavior is very similar. It's what's going on at a small triangle at the origin, which we then translate out. How do we translate it out? With some initial vector v0. For the most part, I'm going to try to just work with the coordinates on the big triangle and just kind of wave my hands as to how things go and how the linear algebra would go. You can read the linear algebra. It's you know, fairly straightforward for linear algebra. The problem is at one point, we need some results from real analysis. And so if you haven't taken real analysis yet, this will be another way to try to motivate why we need classes like this. What are the kind of ingredients we need in real analysis to complete the arguments? Fortunately, we only need a very small amount from real analysis. We need a few results about convergence of sequences. Does every sequence converge? No. no. Can you give me an example of a sequence that does not converge? One, two, three, four, the Spaceball sequence, yes. One, two, three, four, five. Excellent. Any Spaceball fans? Yeah. All right, thank you. At least one or two. All right. So a lot of sequences don't converge. But the sequence you gave me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, well, it doesn't converge for a trivial reason. It's going off to infinity. What if we have a bounded sequence? What if my numbers have to be, say, between 0 and 1? Does every bounded sequence converge? OK, so somebody else give me an example of a bounded sequence. Yes. I mean, you could have been a little bit more entertaining, you know, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Anybody detecting the pattern? Excellent. What's the next one? No. It's not. Zero. Nope. It is, a, it is a sequence that will hop. It has strings of ones, then goes back down to zero. Okay? So you could have a hopping sequence like this. But the main fact is if I give you any bounded sequence, there is a subsequence of it that will converge. And there's no way you can avoid that. And so I'm still trying to decide exactly how much detail I want to get into something like that. The stairs on your faces will probably influence this. If everyone's going like this, we'll do it quickly. If everybody's like eagerly going like this, you know, we'll you know, dwell on that a little bit longer. All right. So what we have here, I'm going to try to concentrate on the two-dimensional case. So here is my v0, my v1, and v2. And now we're looking at things in the form x0, v0, plus x1, v1, plus x2, v2. And the x's are between 0 and 1. And the sum of the xi equals 1. If you think about what's going on, it's telling you where you land in this triangle. So they call this triangle a two-simplex. It's two-dimensional. The one simplex would be a straight line. What would the three simplex be? Three simplex would be what kind of shape? A tetrahedron. I have no idea what the word is beyond tetrahedron. I would just add like a hypotetrahedron. You know, usually if you add hyper, you're pretty safe. <laughs> okay? So the one, two, three, these are the ones you can visualize and get a sense of what's going on. Build your intuition in these cases. For the higher ones, you really just have to work with it formally. So if we start looking at what goes on, what's the easiest case to try to understand this combination? So you've got to give me values of x0, x1, x2 that sum to 1, then between 0 and 1. What's the simplest combination you can think of? 1, 0, 0. Excellent. So if we're at 1, 0, 0, we're just at the point v0. If we're at 0, 1, 0, we're here. And if we're at 0, 0, 1, we're here. So this is the point x0 equals 1. This is the point uh, x1 equals 1. And this is the point x2 equals 1. Right, we've now handled the simplest possible cases, the case when exactly one element is, is non-zero. 
All right, what do you think the next simplest case to look at? I'm sorry? So one possibility is to take all of them to be a third. That will actually give you the point in the middle or the center of mass. You know, right now I've drawn this so it's an equilateral triangle. It doesn't have to be. But there is something easier than jumping straight to the third, third, third case. What should we look at next? Zero, one, half, one, half. Zero, one, half, one, half, right down here. Or more generally, let's look at x naught, x1 are non-zero, and x2 is zero. So this is the line over here when x2 equals zero. And when x0 equals 1, we start here. And then as we increase x1, we correspondingly decrease x0, and we move from here to here. So you can see that as I sweep out x0 and x1, I'm moving along this line. Now if I come over here, I'm now at the point 0, 1, 0 for my x-coordinates. And one of the points the book makes very clearly is that there is a difference between your x-coordinates and your Cartesian coordinates. These v's have vector coordinates. Given those vector coordinates, I can write down the vector coordinates of any point in this triangle. Right now, we're not talking about the Cartesian coordinates. We're writing things in terms of these vectors v0, v1, v2. It's a more convenient basis to look at. Essentially, you should remember from linear algebra, all linear algebra is is converting a problem from one basis to another that may be more convenient for the problem at hand. And the whole point we're trying to find is, what is the simplest basis to look at this? As an aside, how many of you remember the equation of an ellipse? Have we done that in this class yet? We did this in this class? OK, so we saw that you know, when you have the ellipse and you want to rotate the coordinate axes, it's just a rotation. And if you write the equation of the ellipse in this rotated coordinate system, it becomes very clean, and then you rotate back to the manner it's presented. It's something very similar here. This is a really good coordinate system for what's going on. So what do you think this line over here is going to be? x naught equals 0. And if you notice, x naught equals 0 is right across the vertex x0 equals 1. This line x2 equals 0 is right across the vertex v2 coming from x2 equals 1. And last but not least, over here, this is going to be the line x1 equals 1. Zero. I'm sorry, x1 equals 0. Sorry, thank you. I was about to say, why is that the same as? OK. x1 equals 0. If you think about what we were doing before, we played this game where I gave you a triangle, and I said the bottom, we're going to label this vertex 0, 1, 2. And now we need to fill in all the stuff. And on the bottom side, we can only use zeros and ones. And then on this side, I think it was only ones and twos, and on this side it was just zeros and twos. This is where it's coming from. If you look along this side, this is the set of points where the x2 coordinate is zero. This is the set of points where the x0 coordinate is zero. We're only going to have uh, the first and the third, I'm sorry, the, the first and the second down here, the zeros and the ones. In some presentations, they start talking about maybe a direction of how you're moving in terms of where your derivative is. If I'm mapping the triangle to the triangle, well, if I start over here, I can't be moving downward. I've got to be moving somewhere in a direction like this. And so trying to represent things in terms of these lines. All right, so this gives us the equations of the different lines. And now if I want to start getting points inside, well, what would happen now if I chose x0, x1, and x2 all to be not 0? Well, we know if I take x0 to be 0, and I have x1 and x2, I'm going to get some line like this. What would it mean now if I take x0 to be non-zero? Well, I'm basically going to be shifting my line a little bit. And so now, instead of x1 and x2 adding up to 1, maybe they add up to 1, maybe 3 fourths. And they'll be the same as shifting this line inward. So as I increase x0 from 0 all the way to 1, I'm just shifting this line in like this, heading towards x0, heading towards this vertex v0. And this is what happens as I increase x0, I'll be decreasing x1 and x2. 
So as a nice exercise, what you want to do is you want to prove that this maps the triangle to the triangle. That every point in the triangle can be written uniquely as a linear combination like this. If you had to choose a triangle, where would you choose the coordinates of this point to be? So if we tried this to be 0, 0, 0, see the problem is we're in Right. So we've got three vertices. It seems clear, you know, make this one 0, 0. That's not a problem. I could make this one 1, 0, and then the Cartesian coordinates of this one would be a little bit of a pain. Right? I'd have to figure out what is the coordinate of the equilateral triangle. I don't really care about those coordinates. One of the big secrets in linear algebra is not to write down the algebra if you can at all avoid it and just work with the things. We don't care about the Cartesian coordinates. So we'll often just talk about being this combination of v0, v1, v2. And so when I write a vector x0, x1, x2, it's x0, v0, plus x1, v1, plus x2, v2, and that will give me a point in here. And this is a very convenient way. OK? Any questions about this so far? OK. So now the question is, this is building us up to study maybe triangles, or if we're really lucky, non-equilateral triangles. There are far more shapes than just triangles, right? We're not trying to prove a fixed point theorem exists for a map from a triangle to a triangle. We're trying to prove a fixed point theorem of a map from a set to itself. So the question becomes, which sets can we look at? So what we want to do is we want to study sets that are equivalent to each other. So we want to look at when are S and T equivalent. So I want a one-to-one -one onto map F. Let me just make sure I do it in the same note as my notes. Uh, no, I'm doing a G. Uh, G. I will have G, and I'll have G go from the triangle to the set. G inverse will go from the set to the triangle. What one-to-one -one means is G of X equals G of Y implies X equals Y. That you don't have two inputs sent to the same output. Onto means for all little s and big S, there exists a t in t such that g of t equals s. So onto means you give me anything in s, and I can find something in t that's sent to it. So you should visualize it. You know, Here's my triangle. Here's my set s. And I have a map T, I'm sorry, I have a map F, no, G, I'm calling it G, from the triangle to S, and I have a map G inverse from the set back to the triangle. And this becomes a huge subject when are two shapes equivalent. You know, this leads to you know, the subject of topology. Out of curiosity, has anybody here taken topology? Okay. So when you talk about our sets equivalent, this is very similar to what game do you want to play? What rules do you want to put on G? Can anybody think of a mild rule that we should probably as assert for G? Continuous. G should be continuous. If G is not continuous, you know, as long as the sets have the same cardinality, I can divine a truly horrible map between the two sets with absolutely no structure. Right? So if I don't assume G is at least continuous, it's not going to really help me at all to be studying questions like this. All right, now we can start asking for additional properties. Maybe we want G to be differentiable. Maybe we want G to be infinitely differentiable. Maybe we want G to be 
uh, holomorphic, a complex differentiable function. You, know, you can start putting on additional properties. Not surprisingly, the more properties you assert for G, the fewer regions you will have that will be equivalent. Do you think differentiability is going to be hard with the triangle? Yes. Okay. Where do you think differentiability would be hard? At the corners, right? How the hell am I going to get something going on there? Well, maybe what we could do is we could lower our expectations and say, all right, screw that. I'm not going to insist on differentiability everywhere because I've got corners here. Maybe I'll insist on differentiability in the interior. That the interior of this and the interior of that, there's going to be a connection between them. And one of the major results in complex analysis is that so long as this region does not have a hole in it, uh, you give me any finite bounded region like this, I'm not saying this in the full generality, there is an infinitely differentiable map between these two regions. And the map is given by its power series expansion. So it's a very nice, very easy map to prove. This uses an enormous amount of machinery from real analysis. I, there's a huge subject devoted to trying to understand when two regions are equivalent. Right? Let's just assume we have two regions that are equivalent. Somehow we have a map. Why do we care about all of this? It goes back to the ellipse. Do people remember the ellipse calculation going like this, trying to understand? Why am I willing to go like this? What do I gain from doing that? This side of the room has been quiet. What do I gain by rotating my coordinate system? What does the ellipse look like now? It, it lines up. So if, if I go like this, my ellipse now lines up, and it makes the calculations a lot easier. So the idea is, if I have maps like this, if I want to understand S, I can essentially say, screw S. I'm going to study triangles. I am going to become the master of the triangle. And then whatever you give me, I will just take your problem, and I will convert it to a problem about triangles, and I will be happy. And I will solve the equivalent problem in the triangle. And then at the end of the day, I will remember, crap, he likes whatever that kind of shape is. Um, I will convert backwards. That's the whole point of something like this, is that if you can understand what's going on in one region, you can figure out in another. So let's prove a nice lemma. And this was not, I think, explicitly isolated in the book. Let uh, T and S be equivalent under a continuous one-to-one -one onto invertible map G. And I think G is going from T to S. Let, well, here. Yeah. If every function continuous from T to T has a fixed point, same is true for S. That's a nice result. So if we can show that whenever I give you a map from the triangle to the triangle, there's a fixed point, then we know that there is a map. That you give me any map from S to S, S will also have a fixed point. What would you love to know? All right, so one thing we would like to know is every function from T to T has a fixed point. But what else would we like to know? So whenever I give yes. Well, this is like you made a lot of constraints on G, so like the how likely it's active in time is G. Okay, so some of these constraints I actually don't need. I mean, for instance, the word invertible is actually implied from one to one and onto. So I can actually I can cross that out. Oh, okay, so we're just saying invertible means you can go one way and then back. To exactly, back. exactly. Uh, I'm, this is not a real analysis class. It, one to one and onto actually gives you invertibility. I'm just But yeah, I mean one question you would want to know is which spaces S are now equivalent to T. So for instance, if I give you, I haven't had breakfast yet this morning, some kind of donut region. 
Okay, can I map a donut to a triangle? And the answer is sadly no. And this is where you use a lot of topology. And you say, well, imagine you have some kind of curve like this that's closed. It maps to some kind of curve over here that's closed. You talk about you can contract the curve here, but you can't contract the curve here. There's some groups you can associate to them. These spaces are fundamentally different. No breakfast. OK. There was, you know, some things had to be sacrificed. OK. So one thing is we want to know which space is S. But whenever I give you a fixed point theorem, what is your first question? What's the fixed point? Where the hell is it? Right? And so as much as you know about the fixed points of T, you know that about the fixed points of S. And so in complex analysis, a huge subject is the study of the unit disk. And it turns out we understand all the maps from the unit disk to itself, and we know where their fixed points are. And because of that, we can actually take that knowledge and propagate it to other spaces, which is wonderful. The difficulty is you need to know these things about these maps G. All right, so let's do the proof. So the reason I like this proof is it illustrates a great idea in mathematics. It's the idea of transfer. Uh, if you've never seen transfer in mathematics, you have almost surely seen it if you have ever listened to a politician answer a question. How many of you have ever watched a presidential debate, senatorial debate? They're asked a question, they kind of meander for 30 seconds, and then at that point, they then shift into their prepared remarks on something that's somewhat related to the question that was just asked. And they transfer whatever they were given to something they already know. That's exactly what we want to do here. You want to understand something about S, I know everything there is to know about T. So what I want to do is I want to get away from S as fast as possible. I want to transfer it to something about T. So you give me some map F which takes S to S. And let's draw the picture we have. Here's our T. I think this is roughly how S looked. We had G going in this direction, and we had G inverse going in that direction. We don't know anything about S. We know things about T. What I want to do is I want to find a function related to F that lives on T. So we'd have to take inputs in T and give outputs in T. Anybody have any idea of how I could get a function related to f that lives on t? Yes? Okay, so how would I do it? Do I, I can't take g of s. g sends things to s. Okay. So g inverse s. Right. So f takes things in s and gives things out in s. Okay. So my input always has to start off with something in s. So if I want to have a function on t, a function from t to t, I want to start off in t. And if I want to use f, I've got to somehow get to s. Well, there's only one way to go from t to s. I take something in t and I apply g to it. So we write operators, so I would first apply the operator g. Yes? So I would go g, g, f, g inverse. So you write the functions like this. The one on the inside is the one you do first. So this is going to be a map from t to t. And what this means is I g inverse composed with f composed with g of some point x is g inverse of f of g of x. One parentheses, two parentheses, three parentheses. This is what we mean by composition of functions. OK? So when you think about it, this is a very natural thing to do. We want to understand functions from, F, from S to S. We don't know things about S. We know things about T. So I want to associate to my function F a new function T, a new, a new function on T. 
And so the new function is going to be g inverse composed with f composed with g. Could there be a different function I associate? Maybe I have a different map from t to s. And then it becomes an interesting question, how do I associate these back and forth? Are there multiple choices I could make? Once I fix a choice of g, however, this method is unique. I'm not going to get two different choices now of this form. But g inverse composed with f composed with g, this is a function from t to t. What do we know about functions from t to t? I'm sorry? They have a fixed point. Why? Because we assume. It's the simplest possible proof. Uh, you know, we assumed by definition. You know, we are assuming t is a space where a continuous function from t to t has a fixed point. And so, since g inverse f g is a function from t to t, it has a fixed point. Assuming all continuous functions from t to t have a fixed point. Therefore, let's give the function a name h, which will be g inverse composed with f composed with g, has a fixed point. Now the question is, what do you want to denote the fixed point? We need to choose some notation. You could do A, I don't like A. And I'm holding the chalk. Hmm. What would be a good letter to use for the fixed point? We could do X, I mean, we, we really like X a lot. I would say in this poem there's actually a better letter to use that's a little bit clearer than X. T. t. Why would we use T? Because it, it belongs to T. Okay. I am a strong proponent of good notation. Okay. Good notation really helps you glance down and see what's going on. As you get more involved computations, as you go further in mathematics, anything you can do so you can just quickly glance down and see what the hell is going on is worthwhile. So now I don't want to just write t. So I can either give it a subscript f for Why would I give it a subscript f? Fixed point. Or I could give it a star. We often like to use stars for fixed points. Star has been used so much, I'm indifferent between stars and stars. Let's go stars. Oh, that's right. F is, f is a function. Um, I was once in a math class in college where f meant different things on the left-hand side of the equation and the right-hand side of the equation. And so actually, that's a very good reason to use a star and not a fixed point. And not an f for the fixed point. OK, so this means h of t star equals t star, or equivalently, g inverse composed with f composed with g of t star equals t star. What is our goal? Bless sir. What are we trying to do? Show that f has a fixed point. And so now that we know this kind of relation, if we unwind, what do we get? We get g inverse of f of g of t star, close it off, close it off, close it off, equals t star. OK, we're really close to finding a point that's a fixed point for f. Right? We've got this pesky g inverse on the left. How could we get rid of it? Apply g. What do you think g applied to g inverse gives you? It gives you the identity. So you have to prove that the order of operations doesn't matter, that I can regroup parentheses. Technically, I'm supposed to apply g to t star first, then apply f, then apply g inverse, and then apply g. What I want to do is now I want to apply g to all of this. 
close, 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 close. And I want to say, come on, let me just regroup the parentheses a little bit and say that this is the same as this. And I think I killed one parentheses over there. So you need to be able to show that, you know, you need to be able to justify this. Because our function g is 1 to 1 and on to, this is not too bad. There's a unique point that goes. So what does it mean for g inverse of this to be t star? It means g of t star is this. And so this becomes the identity, goes away, wonderful. We're losing parentheses left and right, literally. And this becomes g of t star over here. Okay. This is probably the easiest fixed point question I can ask you. Can you give me a fixed point of f? Yes, what is the fixed point of f? f's fixed point is, so what is the fixed point of f? g of t star. So what we've been able to do is we've transferred transferred a fixed point um, of h to f. And hopefully this explains now why we care so much about triangles. Instead of triangles, what shape could we have looked at? Could have looked at squares. What else could we have looked at? Circles. We chose triangles. Okay. Circles is a horrible, horrible choice. Okay. Anybody have any idea why circles would be a horrible choice? So you know you've got this nice continuous curve for the boundary. If we want to try to break up the circles into smaller circles and have the circles align, not going to happen. What about squares? Can we chop up a square into smaller squares? Yeah, you, you could have developed the theory with squares. Wouldn't be that much harder. Triangles happen to be very nice for a lot of calculations. And so for a lot of things, we can work with triangles. If you really don't like triangles, as a nice exercise, redo the whole theory for squares. If you take certain classes, you might talk about triangularizing a manifold. You have some kind of surface, and you want to divide it up into triangles. The triangles will fit together very nicely. You know, the squares, a little bit more interesting problems. How many of you have seen a proof of Green's theorem? Okay, not as many as should, but you know, in, in Green's theorem, you often talk about trying to triangularize the surface or divide the surface up into squares, some kind of argument like this. So as long as we can understand one region, we can understand any region that's equivalent to it. And so for us, equivalent means we have some continuous function g that maps us from one to the other. OK? All right, any questions about this so far? OK, so everybody is comfortable with this. So this is the beginnings of topology. Uh, yet another math class I somehow missed. You know, if, you, if you want to look at how not to be a math major, my undergraduate career is, I think, you know, a wonderful warning of what not to do. OK. What did you take? Took a lot of analysis. <laughs> um, I actually never took a number theory course. I learned my number theory from the nuclear physicists. And so I actually speak number theory with a very strange accent at times. OK. So we've talked a lot about barycentric coordinates. We've talked a lot about why we care about just doing everything for the triangle. And so Sperner's lemma is going to be equivalent to Brouwer's fixed point theorem. And so Brouwer's fixed point theorem says if you have a continuous function from a nice region S to itself, then it has a fixed point. And so for us, that's going to mean some region that is continuously equivalent to a triangle. Now, of course, instead of doing things in two dimensions, we could do things in three dimensions. And instead of a triangle, we would have a, we would have a, a tetrahedron. And so the tetrahedron, you can somehow blow up and become a sphere. And then you're in four dimensions and higher, it becomes even worse. OK, a question or? OK. So now the question becomes, 
how do we prove Sperner's lemma? And then once we have Sperner's lemma, how does Sperner's lemma imply the Brouwer fixed point theorem? So remember, Sperner's lemma says the following. If you take a triangle 0, 1, and 2, and you can only use zeros and ones over here, you can only use ones and twos over here, and you can only use zeros and twos over here. That if we now subdivide this, I'll do three divisions, uh, one, two, three, one, two, so if we now divide our triangle into smaller subtriangles, at least one triangle has to have all of its vertices labeled distinctly. All right, so the theorem is no way to label a subdivision without one having each label. Okay? So we have two things that we care about. One is just Sperner's combinatorial lemma itself, and then the next is how does this prove the Brouwer fixed point theorem? What's interesting is this is a nice lemma that can be isolated on its own. This is a test as to whether or not you like certain types of mathematics. You can think of it as a game you know, that you're playing with somebody. Here are the rules. You take turns. Can you do it in such a way? Can you play defense so that no matter what the other person is doing, you can prevent them from getting a smaller triangle where all the vertices are labeled differently? Well, since Sperner's lemma is true, what's the answer to that question? No. no. So you can flip it around, and you can say, all right, here, I'll go second. And my goal is to get one triangle where all the vertices have different labels. I'll let you go first, and I'll even let you do two moves for every move I do. What should your strategy be? This is a very simple strategy. Someone over here. Yeah, any rule you give me will work. Play all zeros whenever possible. That will work. Defer, give your turn to the other person, that will work. There's no way you can lose according to Sperner. Now this leads to a very interesting question. How do we prove that there is such a, a triangle? We talked about setting this up as a linear programming problem. Now the difficulty with that is you would then have to run the problem and then see, you know, is there a solution? Then you would have to increase the number of divisions and run again, increase the number of divisions, run again. As a nice exercise, try to set this up as a linear programming problem. You can give each vertex an index, and you can have a binary, or maybe not a binary, you can have some kind of decision variable, a label of 0, 1, or 2 for each one of these. And then for each triangle, you have a set, and you can ask, you know, does it land in? So as a nice exercise, write down a linear programming problem for this. It's not going to be one that we can solve without running a computation. That's not going to be a good way to do this. So the question becomes, how do we prove there is a solution. And the idea is one of the most clever tricks in mathematics in terms of counting. We don't have that many ways of counting in mathematics. So the first thing is to always know your objective. What is our objective here? What are we trying to do? So somebody clearly tell me what we're trying to do. In Sperner's lemma, what is our goal? Show that the set of all triangles with each vertex labeled distinctly is not empty. Okay, so we're trying to show that there is at least the, that there is a triangle with three different labels. Are we trying to count how many such triangles there are? Would we like to know how many such triangles there are? Sure, I mean, if you want to give me more information, great. But for the purposes at hand, 
it's enough to know that there is such a triangle. And then what we're going to do is, you know, later on, we can subdivide everything. We'll keep subdividing. We'll get smaller and smaller triangles. And the fact that you're going to have a triangle with three different labels converging, it's going to basically tell you you're yanking something in three different ways at the same time. There's no way to do such a yank. The only thing you can do is to just not move. And that's going to become the fixed point. All we need is that in each iteration, there is at least one triangle where all the vertices are different. And then it could hop around. Maybe this is the triangle here, but when we subdivide it further, it's one of the triangles in here that comes up. And then when we subdivide further, maybe it comes down here. It could be hopping around. But this goes back to what we were talking about before with boundedness. Each triangle lives in a bounded space. And so if I look at these triangles, the sequence of triangles themselves may not converge. I may hop boom, 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 you know, something like that, like a pinball game. But there will be a subsequence of triangles that converges. And that will give me a path to my fixed point. If there are more triangles, what do you think that might give us? What if we knew there were always two such triangles? Maybe more fixed points. We would have to be careful. We would want those triangles to maybe always be well separated. You know, if you always have two triangles that are separated by a certain amount, there could be two fixed points. We're not trying to prove anything like that. We're just trying to prove there is a fixed point. And so for what we're doing, we just need the existence of one triangle. So you give me any partition. And so we have two main proofs strategies to show something exists if um, S is the set of objects. I'm going to put some kind of parameter here, n. It's going to be at level n. then one possibility is to show that Sn goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. Well, if we can do that, does that imply that there has to be something in Sn? Do we all agree that if we can show that the size of the set goes to infinity, the set must be non-empty? Right? This is overkill. In my 389 class, this is sadly how we prove things such as writing numbers as the sum of three primes. This is how we do things about the proof of uh, infinitely many primes. We often do overkill arguments like this. Something happens infinitely often, therefore it happens. Okay? There is another proof strategy. And I love this. Show the number of elements in Sn is... Who's read the book? This is your chance. Odd. Is odd. What can you tell me about odd numbers? They are odd numbers aren't zero. What's the smallest odd number you can think of? One. We won't consider negative numbers because we know the cardinal of a set is not negative. Smallest non-negative odd number is positive. What about evens? What's the smallest even number you can think of that's non-negative? Zero. So feels for evens. Okay. So we'll continue this on Wednesday. This is the main idea that we're leading up to. This is how we prove Sperner's lemma. We somehow calculate a quantity and we show that the number of elements in it is odd. And if the number of elements is odd, it has to be non-empty. Right. This is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful backdoor.